All right, so before we uh, read chapter three today, or listen to chapter three, uh, just a little recap on the book um, we're reading. Uh, so up until this point, we know that the family was living in, in New York City. They're from Bangladesh, um, but they were living in New York City illegally. Um, and then they were forced to leave New York and go to Canada. Um, but once they got to Canada, um, there was I mean, a bunch of people were trying to get into Canada, so they weren't going to be able to. But since they already left the United States, they couldn't go back. And so the father, um, he was detained and kept. Um, so his name Abba. Abba was kept in a holding cell, kind of like a jail, but not really. Um, and they said he could he could get out for five thousand dollars. So the family now is they need to find five thousand dollars to get him out. Um, and Abba told the girls the two girls to go back to New York City and keep going to school like they have been doing. Um, and the mom is going to stay in a kind of like a homeless shelter um, in the same town that the dad is being held in. So that's where we're at right now. So the dad just told the girls that they needed to go back to New York and live a normal life and go to school and live like how, live like they were before all this happened. So. We will play starting right now. You'll hear a little bit of the end of chapter two, and then we'll start chapter three. The sky over Burlington looks like it's made of clear blue glass. I think of Abba behind the crosswire fence, the way his face broke into wrinkles when he'd heard the news of his detainment. Abba loves this country in his own way. It's like this bowl he carries in his heart, so full so ready to trust. And right now, as we head to the highway, all I can hear is the sound of his heart shattering. Chapter 3. Every family has a story. Ours begins with water. My family lived in the part of the world where there's no difference between land and sea. Bangladesh sits on the northeast corner of India, called Bengal, and looks like a great fan traced with purple-brown veins of rivers. Once, we were part of a kingdom that stretched from the high mountains of Assam to the dense jungles of Orissa, sloping down to the sandy beaches of the holy city of Puri. Then the British, men with ledgers and rubber boots, arrived and wanted to slice Bengal in half, one part for the Muslims and the other for the Hindus. That lasted only a couple of days, because a lot of people protested, and Bengal stayed as one. Still, no matter where our borders, this is a land where the earth melts into the sea, and back again. Where people sing the same songs, and eat the same white-fleshed hilsa fish, wherever they live. There's a Bangla phrase, Chorbanga ar chorgora e nige amadar jiban. Land disappears, land appears. This is our life. That's why I'm fascinated with maps. They tell one story. Yet no matter where people draw the borders, the land tells another. And I like putting the two parts together, figuring out the bigger story. A long time ago, our family lived by the water. We had several small houses arranged in a circle. In one house lived the unmarried sisters, who kept their heads covered and bathed in the river every morning and every evening, and sang as the sky turned violet, and the land seemed to shift with the turning tide. In another house lived the brothers, and in the big one were the married couples and the elders. The women swept the mud ground with brooms made of twigs, and fished in flat-bottomed boats. All my great-uncles, I have heard were great swimmers, diving to the bottom of the marshy river to pull up the jute plants. My great aunts would split the stalks in the courtyard and then spread them out to dry like the wash. When the rains came, they fastened all the pots to the roof and tucked their clothes into cubby holes high in the walls. 
Sometimes it took an hour just to wade through the swirling brown water to visit a friend in a village. But the rains were good, even when the hurricane winds flung coconuts from the trees, even when the river water rippled so high the tin roofs shuddered and heaved. My family lived in a part of the world where there was no difference between land and sea. The water rose, and you went with it, like the reeds that leaned and bent outside. And after the rainy season was over once more, the land returned. There were no borders. There was only this way of living, back and forth, between ground and water, year after year. But then came the year when the sky did not spill over, and heat flashed across the countryside in a blinding firestorm. Everything shriveled to dirt and dust. My great grandmother saw the skin on three of her children shrink to dry bone until they died. The sacks of rice were empty, all gone to the British soldiers fighting the Japanese on the Bengal border, or to those who could afford the high prices. It was 1943, a terrible year for our part of the world, and my great grandparents gathered their pots and pans, their woven rugs, their bits of gold for their daughters' dowries, and took their family along the dusty road to Dhaka. There, my great grandfather and grandfather found work in a jute firm. A few years later, the men with ledgers got their way. When the British left as rulers, a new map with new borders was laid upon us. This was called partition. Bengal was finally lopped in half. One part belonged to the new nation of India and held mostly Hindus. The other part, where we lived, held mostly Muslims and belonged to the other new nation, Pakistan. It was a funny kind of map, since Pakistan lies more than a thousand miles away with India in between. During partition, there were terrible riots between Hindus and Muslims. Grandmother's childhood friend, Kamla, was chased down the road her sari a sheet of flames. Half the houses were charred to black ash, and the people from the other side, in what had been West Bengal, kept coming, flooding into our villages the way the water used to come. These are the stories you hear from your grandmother, with the dry rattle in her throat, her teeth stained red from pan and betel leaves, from your abba when he's in a quiet mood and smooths your hair over and over. You're only little, but you know it's there. That feeling that you never know what terror will pulse from the ground.